as you can plainly see here, this look is iconic of the slave length in the period of 1890 to 1893 with, as I'm sure you are all aware, the usual method of blah 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 blah. As I'm sure you are all aware, watching others talk about their historical research can feel like watching someone do a magic trick or speak a foreign language. It's something you could probably do, but where do you even start? And how did they learn what the iconic sleeve length from the period of 1890 to 1893 even was in the first place? I honestly have no idea if there's an iconic sleeve length, but you get what I'm saying. Today on 21st Century Victorian, we're going to talk about how to do your own historical research and how to find these things out for yourself. For history bounders, our goal is to bring historical touches into our daily wardrobe. For costumers, the goal is often to recreate a specific piece, or at least create a new one that's in keeping with what would have been done in the time period of interest. In both of these cases, we want to know what someone working at the time we're interested in would have done making the same thing. And there are definitely some ways we can try to find this out. Since I've been working on a late 1890s tea gown for a while now, I'm going to talk about that here and walk you through my research process. I've tried to break this down into a couple of sections, starting with how easy they are to use and how easy they are to access. I've also added timestamps so that if there's something you're particularly interested in, you can just jump to there. So where do you even start? I know this gets mocked as a search tactic and when I was in high school I was definitely told not to use it. but. I would honestly start with places like Wikipedia and Google. Don't take these as gospel and they're not going to be exhaustive. But if this is your first foray or you just even need the background, they are really great jumping off points. For example, when using Wikipedia, I recommend skimming the article, but you're probably not even going to use most of the information in that. What you are going to do is scroll down and see if there are additional notes or sources and then you're going to go and try to find those. While they will not be an exhaustive bibliography on this subject, consider them your first clue. In the case of the tea gown entry on Wikipedia, as of late March, there are several entries that look useful. We are going to first start with the terminology, what is a tea gown, on the dreamstress. This is a blog post by a textile and fashion historian and gives a good overview on what a tea gown is. Blogs can be a good place to start because, unlike academic sources, they are usually written to be accessible and not behind a journal paywall. I'll go more into those later. This blog post is quite a find. It is clearly well researched, as evidenced by the original fashion plates and primary sources listed. It goes into detail about what a tea gown is and how you distinguish it from other similar fashions at the time. And the author provides links to their sources, meaning that you can go verify it for yourself or read more about tea gowns. Additional googling of tea gowns gets us even more links and information on what they are, how they were influenced by Japanese style at the time, and images of extant garments. These are all great and I encourage lots of exploration here. This is also a great way to get inspiration and start to decide on what you would like to include in your own piece. And this is where you start to get a feel for things like that iconic sleeve length. As you start to look at these descriptions and images of tea gowns, pay attention to what's similar and what's dissimilar about them. Are ones in similar years really close to each other? Is there a point at which you can find a delineation? Is there a point at which they drastically change? Do they have a characteristic sleeve or silhouette or some other element that really marks them as a tea gown? As you start to look at these with a critical eye, you will really start to get a sense of what distinguishes an 1890s version of something from a 1900s version, because you'll start to become familiar with those elements. It does take active attention and time, but this is how we build that knowledge base. Did your Googling turn up any primary sources or historic accounts about your subject matter? For example, a newspaper or flash and plate talking about an exciting new tea gown from 1890 or a new style element that's being included this season. These are what we'll call primary sources. They were written and documented by someone who was alive during the time we're interested in, often by someone who experienced it in some way. Secondary sources, like the blog post we found, are interpretations of primary sources, or interpretations of multiple primary sources. Both are useful, but it's important to remember that secondary sources are interpretation of primary sources. They can be great for providing additional information and context, but if they're available, you should use both. With today's digital connectedness, you're able to access more primary sources than ever. One good example is archive.org. This is a digital repository of sources in the public domain. Here I have found an issue of the world of fashion from 1881 that talks about suitable tea gown fabrics and trimmings, and another describing a fashion plate of a tea gown. Again, try to notice similarities and differences across descriptions and years. In these issues, 
We can get a sense that tea gowns were very much detailed and frilly affairs with considerable trim. This page from the Delineator in 1894 shows us a broad variety of patterns were available for the aspiring tea gown maker or owner. Digital museum collections can also be a fantastic resource, especially in this endless epoch of pestilence. In cases where there is a digital archive, it's likely to be high resolution images with pretty good descriptions and captions that include the provenance of the garment, when it was made, and what materials it was made of. Sometimes you can even get close-up detail shots. While this isn't as good as getting to go and see it in person in the museum, it's better than going in blind. A couple of good ones I've been using are the VNA, the Kyoto Costume Institute, and the Met. Once you've gone through these sources and looked at these images and are starting to get a sense for what it looks like, what common elements were, and things you'd like to include, it's time to start thinking about how to make your own. In making my tea gown, I decided I wanted to start with a tea gown pattern. I didn't really want to draft this one myself. Truly Victorian has one, but it's designed to go over a corset, and since I don't have a corset and I didn't want to redraft the waist, that was kind of a non-starter for me. Past Patterns also has one that's based on a really cool old Butterick pattern, but it's perpetually out of stock, so that was another dead end. Luckily for me, Laughing Moon had a pattern based on an extant tea gown from the 1890s. It even included trim in some places I wanted to trim, and didn't require a corset, though it could be worn with or without one. So that's what I decided to go with. If you cannot find a pattern, or you just don't want to use one, my other recommendation would be to look for Victorian drafting manuals, or drafting manuals if they exist from whatever period you're interested in. However, this isn't a great beginner place to start. It takes a lot of work. Additionally, the best case scenario you have access to an extant garment is to take a pattern from it. However, again, this is difficult if you're a beginner. If you don't know how it went together in the first place, it can be hard to kind of visually deconstruct it. This requires knowing how to examine the gown, being able to visually deconstruct it, knowing how to trace pattern pieces off of it, and then being able to kind of put it back together in your head. It's a great skill and it's one you'll learn as you put lots together, but until you've done that putting together process, mentally taking it apart is going to be a lot harder. Okay, research is great, but sometimes the devil is in the details. If you've watched any of my tea gown vlogs, you'll know that the Laughing Moon pattern doesn't actually say how to finish the seams. And in recreating your own garments, you may find small details or elements omitted like that, or helpful instructions like finish in the usual way. Another example of this is when I spent 45 minutes trying to figure out how to put the placket in the front of this shirt because the patterns didn't have any placket instructions. In both of these cases, my first step was to try and Google the problem. However, especially for the tea gown, I didn't find much luck. There definitely wasn't a source out here that said, here's how tea gown seams were finished in 1892 when made from sea. So I had to do a little more digging. I tried to find pictures of the inside of a tea gown. That can be really helpful if you can find high resolution images because you can see how the sewing is done. But again, not much luck. I did get lucky because Lady Rebecca Fashions has an extant tea gown that she does a garment description of in one of her videos. So I spent a lot of time watching that and pausing and trying to blow it up as big on my screen as I could so I could see how the seams were finished. In most cases on the tea gowns, the seams seemed to be felled to the lining. However, because I was using a really flimsy silk brocade, I was afraid this just wouldn't stabilize them enough. So I looked at other extant seam finishes from the period. In the end, I decided to go with a bias bound seam finish. I don't 100% know that this is something they would have done on a silk tea gown, in the 1890s, but I know it's a finishing technique that they used in the 1890s on other garments. So it's reasonable to assume that it may have been used on a tea gown. In the case of this shirtwaist, I actually happened to own an Edwardian shirtwaist, which I remembered after like 45 minutes of Google. So I pulled that out. In the case of mine, it was top stitch. So I knew that on at least one extant Edwardian shirtwaist, the placket was top stitched. I tried to find zoomed in images of other ones to see if this was common, but again, no real luck. For each of these details you come across, I suggest just trying to dig wherever you can. And if you can't find an answer, try to figure out what would have been done at the time on other things, and don't be afraid to kind of mix and match a little bit. I know it's not ideal, but 
we don't always have perfect extant documentation on what was done. And so approximating what we think would have been done is sometimes the best we can do. You'll still have an awesome costume. Now, apart from happening to have an extant garment in your collection, those are the kind of easy to access, easy to find sources. For a more general look in future non-pestilent epochs, I suggest trying to go to museums and look at their collection. Seeing pieces mounted, this is what we call when they're up on a dress form or some other display instead of laying flat gives you a really good sense for how did it flow? What did the weight do to it? How did the construction elements actually look when worn? It's not as great as actually seeing someone wearing it, but we can't always have what we want. The best option, if you had this at your disposal, is to examine an extant garment. However, this can be difficult, expensive, and of limited feasibility. You may have to travel somewhere like the Kyoto Costume Institute in Kyoto, Japan, to examine a particular garment and you may not have the right academic introductions or the collection may not do those kind of appointments. Some institutions do not allow appointments to view their garments and some only do it for researchers with university affiliations or connections. So for many, this may be inaccessible. Buying extant garments is also great, but hard on the pocketbook and they can be difficult to find, especially if you're trying to vet them online. So again, this may be an infeasible option for many. But if you do have access to either of these, the information they can give you is invaluable. I would also like to mention academic journals. I have recently been reading an article on how the tea gown may be presented as a little bit more progressive than it probably was. It was probably much more a staple of polite society, at least according to this author. However, like examining extant garments in collections, this is a really limited access option as well. Many journals are behind paywalls, meaning that you either have to have a journal subscription or pay by the article. And journal subscriptions are often exorbitantly expensive. Some journals, like the Journal of Dress History, are free and available to anyone. However, Victorian tea gowns, a case of high fashion experimentation, is $45 for 48 hours of access to the one article or $262 for 30 days of access to the full journal. So, if you cannot find an open access copy or are not associated with the university that has access, they are rarely worth the money. I will spare you my rant on how broken the system of academic publishing is. Suffice it to say that this is one of the many reasons I left Publisher Parish behind after I finished my doctorate. So, while I recommend trying to find and access journal articles on your subject, especially if your interest is more in the cultural or wider significance of a garment, I would not devote too much effort or money on this endeavor. So I largely omitted books from this because that's pretty much its own video, which I'm also happy to do if there's interest. But I do want to take a moment to mention bibliography. Far from just the works cited page you had to create for your high school English paper, bibliographies are actually a wealth of information if you want more resources to look at. And any good historical book should contain a bibliography to give you more reading on its subject matter or you, and to cite its sources. Even if a book only obliquely mentions your topic, there may actually be more in the bibliography to go in depth into. So I would check any sources they list in reference to the thing you're interested in. If you find your topic in a book, even minimally, it's probably worth checking out the bibliography or works cited to see if you can find more information. While this video is just a quick summary on where to find sources and how to do your own research, it can also pretty easily bury you in a lifetime of information. Some of being a good researcher is knowing when to stop, and there are a couple of metrics I like to use for this. The first is something we use in qualitative research called saturation. When you stop seeing new ideas, when all the information you're finding echoes sources and information you've seen before, you've probably pretty thoroughly covered the topic. You're not gonna find new information at that point. And you've probably reached what is the general consensus on whatever your subject is. For us as history bounders and historical customers, the answer can also be when you've had enough. If you know what you wanna make and you've got the techniques you wanna use, go get started. And finally, it can be because you've got the exact thing you want and you know what you want to do and you're off to the races or because you couldn't find anything and you're just going to do your best. There is no perfect or correct amount of historical research, just like there is no perfect or correct amount of historical accuracy. There is only getting the level of understanding you want to proceed. And don't let perfect be the enemy of good here or get discouraged because you don't know exactly how to do it. Some of these things you learn from practice. Don't confuse researching with actually doing. You will figure out things and ideas that just make sense once you've tried them. So don't get so bogged down in doing the research or trying to figure out the perfect garment that you forget to actually make it. If you have any additional tips or thoughts on how you do your own research or questions on how to do other specific types of research, please put them down in the comments. I can really nerd out on this stuff and would love to chat about it.
Research can also be kind of a big and daunting topic, so any tips or tricks we have to share will probably help all of us. Also included my sources in the description in case anyone wants to go do more reading on anything I found here. And with that, my dear viewers, we've come to the end of our missive. But before I bid farewell, what are you currently researching or what's your next research project? I'd love to hear about it. And with that, I remain as ever your faithful servant and 21st century Victorian, Francis Worthington.